sorry, there's a bit of a hi. Marcus, hi, so I think Excellent. I can see you and hear you. Excellent. I'm just turning the Finally. volume down a bit. Yeah, we've got there. Excellent. There we are. So, Excellent. How Thank are you. you. Uh, I'm good. Uh, finally, uh, we managed to get this together. <laughs> I was beginning to worry a little bit. But um, lovely to see you, Marcus. Uh, it's wonderful to connect. And, uh, you know, today's been a fantastic, beautiful day here in Delhi. So um, I hope you have blue skies as well. Those of you who are watching, I hope you can hear uh, both of us. Uh, thank you, Rare India, for putting this together. And, um, you know, uh, many of us, I mean, as you know, my name is Shoiti Banerjee, I should introduce myself. I work uh, with Outlook's uh, Responsible Tourism Initiative. We uh, support and celebrate uh, travel companies that in turn support and celebrate local communities and the planet. Uh, and today, as you know, we are here for a chat with someone who many of us have admired for several years. He's a stalwart, really, in uh, wildlife tourism and responsible tourism in South Asia and really across the world. Um, so, Marcus, uh, for those of you who don't know him, he is the co-owner of Tiger Mountain Pokhara Lodge in Nepal, uh, a man who calls himself a responsible conservation tourism fanatic, and you'll find out shortly why. Um, he also mentors various local and international charities uh, working in Nepal. And of course, he's involved in policy making and, uh, you know, whatnot. I mean, he's, he's done a whole bunch of things. So welcome, Marcus. Uh, wonderful to, uh, to connect with you. And we have only about 30 minutes. So uh, let's dive straight in, I think. Uh, the obvious question here, uh, since we are talking about it, is what, according to you, is 100% uh, sustainable? Because both 100% and sustainable are heavily loaded uh, you know, as words. So, Marcus, over to you. Namaste, Soti. Nice to meet you again. Um, yes, what is 100% sustainable? I don't think it exists because it's like climbing a hill in the Himalayas. You know, you, you get to what you think is the, the horizon and the ridge, and lo and behold, there's another 1,000 feet ahead of you, and you get to that, and there's another 1,000 feet ahead of you. <laughs> so I, I think sustainability is one of those ongoing journeys rather than a, a, a single point destination. Um, it's all about the journey and that incremental process of growth and experience that comes with it. So in many ways, sustainability and travel go together very well because, of course, travel is a journey and an experience and a process as much as a destination. Wonderful. So, Marcus, you know, I, I know that, uh, you know, you're one of the few uh, places in, you know, you've been doing it for a long time, long before these words were really coined, um, you know, whether the term responsible tourism, sustainable tourism, or we've had eco-tourism and, you know, so many other such words. Now we're hearing transformational tourism and regenerative tourism. But really, I mean, it's, uh, I know how, how, how deeply involved you have been uh, individually and with the organizations that you've worked with over the years, uh, both at Tiger Tops and then at uh, now at uh, the Mountain, uh, you know, Pokhara Lodge. Um, you know, the community has been crucial to uh, to your conversations. So how, you know, how, how do you see that in the current context? Why, how would you say that that would become our strength? as uh, in the travel community and that would that would benefit everybody and that's really the only way to go forward it is you're right the only way to go forward i think we can draw a parallel from uh, wildlife conservation in, in both in india and nepal where it started with guns and guards um as a, as a necessary get the job done quick fix but we've all moved to embracing the community. Uh, in Nepal, there's a strong um, community-based um, participatory anti-poaching groups where local villagers, young youth, youth clubs, everyone are involved in anti-poaching poaching, patrolling, in, in intelligence gathering and reporting. So, so it is an incredible community thing. And, and the same is a parallel within, as you say, all those different terms for... for what I call responsible tourism, because I like the word responsible, because it's taking responsibility for sustainability. And I think if we all stand up and take responsibility 
And we can do it in tiny ways or in very big and significant ways, but if we're all doing something, it's amazing how that multiplier effect will increase the beneficial impacts. Yeah, so, I mean, there are, of course, I mean, it's, uh, you make it sound very easy, Marcus, uh, and we all know that it's probably the toughest path to walk. Uh, even the smallest decisions can be uh, very hard to take, you know, especially if you're trying to be as, you know, as, as sustainable as you are, for instance. So in the current context, uh, knowing that uh, there has been a sort of a pause and it, it's going to be a longish pause, um, both in terms of conservation and in terms of the communities that are involved in tourism, um, you know, the kind that you endorse and that the ki kind that you're involved in. How do you see uh, that panning out and what are the challenges and how do you see us getting past them? I think the, well, the challenges are fairly, I think, plain for all of us to see and I, th I think the businesses are going to be very severely impacted. But the people I worry about are, are not the, the well-established businesses who, I'm sorry, I'm a bit brutal on this, but if you've been going for 20 years, you should have some reserves in your business. Because whether you call it coronavirus, SARS, MERS, an earthquake, your hotel burning down, which could happen after all, anywhere in the world. Uh, look at the things that have happened in Australia recently. Yeah, um, basically, adverse situations arise and do arise pretty regularly. And I think when you're in less developed economies or in more remote locations, the impacts of those adverse events are more severe. You know, it takes longer for, a, for the fire brigade to respond in, in rural Nepal than it does, let's say, in central London. So, you know, you have to have reserves, and those reserves, in the biggest sense, reserves, cash reserves, obviously, financially, but also, you know, personnel, equipment, everything, you have to have reserves. So I'm not entirely sympathetic with the um, business owner from business that's been around for 20 years who, who announces how sustainable they are and then says the hardest thing I did in my life was to lay off half my staff yesterday. You know, we haven't been in this coronavirus threat for very long, three months, four months. Um, life, life is a bit, you know, goes on a bit longer than that. And if, if your capacity to sustain is only three months, that's probably not very sustainable. And look, we all have heard people, planet, profit, commerce, culture, community. You know, they're all the same issues. And in all of them, we have the profit or the financial um, word, it must be there. And I think it behoves on all of us to make sure that we have those reserves. Now, obviously, it's too late now for those that don't, but we should have done. And that's probably a big lesson for everyone to take away. The people who suffer are not, as I say, the big businesses or the, even the small but well-established businesses. It's, it's the pony man. It's the porter on track. It's the person on daily wages living from hand to mouth they're the people who I think need real support at this time. And obviously there is no simple one-size-fits-all support measure, but I think every community that can help, whether it's food support or anything, just to give people a sense of, while this is hell, there is light at the end of the tunnel, there is support on the way through this tunnel. I think that's the most important thing. I think tourism will change massively, but I think it's too early to define how. You've got the balance between humans being creatures of habit, therefore, regrettably, we'll bounce back to what we were when, when the coronavirus issue is sort of becomes either the new norm or, or, or fades away. Or we will um, not bounce back, but we will change in a very different direction. It's very different, just as it's, you know, doctors are finding it difficult to know how to treat the virus. So it is for us, I think, to look into a crystal ball now and come up with any real valid or valuable um, suggestions as to the future. So, I mean, you know, I'm going back and forth also because I think uh, it's, this is a, it, it's a time when many of us have actually looked back to learn um, and there are a lot of lessons that, uh, you know, that, that we must take from the past and 
uh, like you said, adversity is not new. Uh, and it's been in different forms. So if you, in effect, if I may ask you, your early years in Nepal, and um, especially, you know, because Tiger Tops has been doing this for 60 years before the National Park was there, and, you know, so it, it, it was probably the kind of, you know, the kind of challenges that uh, even a corona, modern coronavirus cannot, uh, you know, invent. Uh, you probably walked down, you know, walked down that road. So, is there something from you know those years when when tourism was, uh, you know, when you had to imagine an alternative sort of form of tourism uh, when it didn't exist? So, from those years, are there any lessons there, um, you know, that you could apply today or that we could apply as a community? I think actually. You know, uh, doing sustainable tourism inside a country's premier national park, you have certain advantages. You know, the laws are all on your side. The regulations are all on your side. And, of course, in those days, um, the government of Nepal had, I think, a very innovative and effective policy, perhaps generated because Tiger Tops was already there when the national park was, was incorporated or gazetted. Um, so unlike, let's say, the Indian model, it's more closer to the African model, where you could have tourist operations inside core areas of national parks. That's changed, and we can lay aside whether that was a good or a bad change. It's change that's happened. My biggest sort of learning curve, I think, wasn't actually joining Tiger Tops in terms of sustainability. It, it was um, when I moved from Tiger Tops up to Tiger Mountain, Pokhara Lodge, because, of course, suddenly one was in a village or on the edge of a village and one was having to do sustainable tourism in a community where the aspirations probably were very different. And you didn't have any regulations or any army or anyone to, to sort of back you. So that was a great learning curve. I think, you know, live the belief. I think all of us in Rare believe in sustainability. All of us believe that responsible tourism is the way ahead. So it's a case of we believe that, so live it. Live it for real. And I slightly disagree with your earlier point when you said that it can be very difficult. Yes, at extreme levels it can, but there's also amazing small steps that are easy to implement and, and work. I will, the, the crazy one we had last season where our barman, Sujan, just suddenly said, hey, why are we recycling all these wine bottles and buying mineral water for guests who want mineral water? Because we, we served our own water generally, but for guests who insisted on it, we had a little mineral water. And said, why don't we just relabel our wine bottles and, and put in our own water? And we did it, and we explained why, and we put a message on the bottle to explain what we were doing. And it's had brilliant take-up. So now I think we have five bottles of mineral water in the whole place just for the real diehard. Yeah, it's a small thing. Um, it takes crea creativity, and I'm blessed. I, I'm quite good as, as an administrator and an implementer, and a, okay, here's the idea, how do we manage it? I'm not great at having the original idea. So to have this amazing team of staff who come up with all the ideas is bliss for me. And so it really works. And I, I think it doesn't matter whether you're doing a big and complex um, issue of sustainability or a tiny one, as long as you're doing it. And we're humans, we're competitive. If you are doing small things in the sustainability field, your instinct will be to do more. And I think this is where the key point comes in. It's not just the doing, it's the recording of what you're doing. Because if you know that you reduced your plastic going to waste by 100, 100 kilos last year, you want to do 150 this year. You want to improve, you want to be better. And therefore, what you do, logging it, and having that as, as an empirical backing for your actions is really important. It also it helps the staff because they can see, well, we've achieved something. It prevents greenwashing, which, which Amit was talking about so sensibly this yeah. morning. Yeah, it's really important that, that you can prove what you say you do. And yeah, you talk it, but you've got to walk it too. Yeah, you're one of the few, I think, who, who have been uh, measuring impact uh, you know, uh, for the last few years, and uh, you know, it's 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 quite interesting because I know that uh, you know there are certification models, there are all kinds of uh, models, and I I, I know I remember reading that uh, 
you're not, I mean, you don't think, you know, all models are for everyone, which I, I completely agree. But, uh, you know, coming back to um, the aspect of uh, the, the human element of our, our business, because I think that's where, uh, I mean, the wildlife, of course, because I know that poaching could be a, we, we, they talked about it this morning. It's, it's, there, yeah. there are fewer pairs of eyes out there and it's, you know, yeah. that brings with it a lot of issues. But it also, we, I think a lot depends on how much, how quickly and how well we build trust, right? So somebody like you, yeah. who, you know, and you, you talked about the aspirations of the people and, you know, there is going to be a greater anxiety, even if there isn't a real, you know, the, because people in rural areas are actually more resilient, I find than they are in mm. urban areas. So uh, more likely that they will bounce back more easily. But there will be anxiety because there's so much talk around it. So how do you want, how do you think you can build their trust and the trust of the traveler who, who you know, who comes back to you? I think that there's two very key points there. First and foremost, um, you know, as I was on another um, Zoom, you know, webinar, and someone said, the hotel is the community, the community is the hotel in another part of the world. And so bringing all your stakeholders on board is absolutely key in, in terms of planning the reopening. There is no point going out there and saying welcome guests from the 1st of May or whenever it may be if the village says no way, we, they might infect us. So you've got to have your local community on board. More importantly than that, you've got to have your staff on board. At the end of the day, just like a doctor or a nurse, if a guest comes down with, with COVID symptoms, and let's, for the sake of the argument, assume that they are genuinely infected, someone's got to clean that room. And, and, you know, and that is not someone who's done a medical degree or done a nursing qualification. So having people confident on board, and yes, we, are, we agree it's now safe to come back, is, is the first step. Then obviously you can go out to your communities of the travel industry and to, and through all its ramifications to the guests. But but making sure that the local communities, the staff, everyone are on board that the time is right is vital. Going out to the guests, the second phase of that, yes, I think showing you have without paranoia. I think what I've seen recently is an awful lot of paranoia. You know, it would appear that every every room has to be fumigated with, with chlorine concentrations that would have been last seen in the First World War, um, it, you know, is probably a rather excessive response. But the underlying truth is that being able to show that you are following whatever your own high standards or if there's a government standard, obviously the government regulation must be followed. I think one of the big challenges, and certainly what I'm looking for now, is showing the cleaning is fine, but I don't really want to have to go back to high concentrations of bleach because they're against all our sort of environmental principles. So looking for the eco-friendly COVID-busting soap and water is what I'm really um, studying now. And I know other rare lodge owners have been in various debates on this, but that is something we need to find because... Yes, you, you, if the government imposes it, you have to follow the law. We're all subject to the law. But if we can do it better, achieve the objective without the negative environmental consequences, then obviously that's, that's going to the heart of what we mean by being sustainable. And, and so there is the theatre of hygiene. I think people talk about the theatre of, of um, security at airports, let's say, where all the checks you go through are really more for show than for substance because the real security is done behind the scenes and with intelligence and other things. Um, you know, rather than cleaning your, your public rooms of your lodge at 6 a.m. before the guests get up, we probably will be cleaning them you know, at 10 a.m. so that the guests see them being cleaned and can see how thoroughly it's being done. I think things like that, that build confidence and messaging that right, again, not in a preachy or paranoid manner, neurotic manner, but in a calm and collected and confident manner, you know, quiet, quiet confidence is, I suspect, what's needed in all our messaging to show we're doing the job, you needn't worry, you can trust us. Something like that. 
that that sounds about right also because i mean i i i'm sure you would agree that we actually saw some reports yesterday that emirates for instance is already testing people at one of their hubs for a flight that they were sending i think to tunisia or something so uh, so there will be more and more checks at i think entry points and uh, even within i think countries uh, where domestic travelers are moving there will i'm sure be other protocols that that will be followed before they arrive at your doorstep so yeah. uh, you know so i think some of those things will be taken care of but uh, you know there is another worry and i think uh, it's a question that a lot of us are asking is that uh, uh, you know there is not going to be uh, we don't know who the traveler all of this is conjecture anyway but you know the traveler may not be able to pay um, quite a bit or i mean there are those who will be able to pay who they they can pay anyway but and they will probably come back but it, there is a risk of people wanting shorter holidays uh, and get sustainable holidays and we know that there is a bit of a catch there uh, you you know doing something short can rarely be sustainable but how do you see that panning out i mean do you think uh, you know in terms of how how the traveler comes back and the kind of experiences they're looking at beyond the protocol you'll have to make a few changes uh, in in the offerings or it remains the same and it's it's all right i think i think the the overall offering of a quality sustainable or responsible tourism lodge the overall offering will remain broadly the same yes there will be fine tunings that may change things a bit you know i think all our lodges in the rare family are hygienic already yeah. so we will just have to sort of you know fine tune it by ensuring that it is up to the standards not just to the generic hotel standard that we had pre covid i think in terms of the product you're selling again it will be fine tuned rather than a dramatic shift I think what I'm hearing and it makes some sense is that of course any reopening will be gradual so it will be like the ripples in a pond going out um so local tourism national domestic tourism will start up first and gradually build up to the sort of longer haul tourist models I think there is a fear you know you can see the logic that you don't want to be crammed in a plane with lots of other passengers for 14 hours or whatever um so short haul single point destinations will probably be the first to see a a a bounce back i think probably it won't be a bounce back it'll be a gradual climb back i don't see it that it was suddenly going to be swamped with tourists i i think it's going to be a steady process but that steady process is probably quite good because it allows us to think it allows us to to adapt and not only adapt on paper but adapt in practice what post covid tourism might might look like and at this where i don't think we can really say i think we've just got to be responsive sensitive um you know hear hear what governments say hear what authorities say and em- implement that in an empathetic and sensitive way that ensures that the qualities of what we do in all our rare properties shine forth and and still become an incredible value holiday for for the traveler who's boldly going out there and discovering that the world still exists after lockdown that's that's a uh, you know that, that's all our hope i think everybody's hoping much the same but you know it's a uh, it's it's just it's just that i think uh, a lot depends also on the policies um and while i know that a lot of discussions are going on and you know in in your country and i'm sure in several states and ours as well uh, is there anything in terms of policy that you would like to uh, i'm you know this is short because i don't think everybody here would be interested but what what do you think in terms of policy the key thing that needs to change uh, in in south asia in terms of uh, sustainability oh i don't think it well i think it's it's not a thing that needs to change in sustainability i really hope and i i've said this to various friends in the nepalese uh, travel industry because i think it very much should be nepal led and nepal inspired and the same for india and any other country around the world but i really hope we've had this god given opportunity this pause this lockdown to rethink 
why tourism, how tourism, what tourism. And I really hope that in that process, sustainability as a whole gets right to the top of the agenda for governments, for tourism authorities, for destination management organizations, for DMCs, for travel agents and designers, and for all the hotels and accommodation and restaurant and other properties, the whole tourism industry. Let's really review and be more sustainable. Let's really not take a tentative step. Let's forge ahead on the sustainability journey and let's do it together. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. But before, I know we're running out of time, but before we, uh, you know, before we finish this session, I just wanted to ask you, what would you like to tell the travelers? I know that you've been, uh, you par perhaps attract a certain kind of traveler to you, thanks to, thanks to the image and, you know, the work that you've done over the years. Uh, but what would you like to tell them? How would you like to reassure them? Or, you know, what would you like? I don't know. I mean, I shouldn't use, put words in your mouth, but what is it that you would like to tell them, really? I, I think stay safe. Don't spend too much time on social media because it'll only <laughs> panic you. Um, and lis listen, listen to those sensible, small, calm voices that, that tell us the truth. That is, yes, it is now safe to travel. Don't travel before that. I said the same thing after the 2015 Gurkha earthquake in Nepal, you know, which was in May. And I said, don't come until September and just review then. You know, so you have to say no. Sometimes I think we're, we're all too naughty. You know, when it's right to say no, you say no. So my, my message for, the, for the, gr the great global traveler is pause now. Dream now and travel later. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Marcus. It was wonderful talking to you. And there were several wonderful insights that you shared. I hope those who were listening uh, found it as interesting as I did. And uh, we'll turn to you again for uh, hope and direction very soon. So thank you for joining me and uh, thank you, Rare, for doing this. Bye-bye. Thank Namaste. you, Saiti. Thank you, thank you, Rare. Bye. Bye.